So I think one thing that our industry needs to not forget about is that if we don't solve the music education component and how to support people learning music if they don't come from means, we're never going to fix our issues of diversity. Hello and welcome to episode number nine of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons and I am your host. This podcast features interviews with accomplished performing musicians who are doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll unpack their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. And it's my hope that these interviews will provide value no matter where you are on your musical journey. If you're thinking about a career in music, if you're in music school now, a working musician, or if you're a music lover and just curious to learn more. This week, I sat down with Boston-based cellist and arts entrepreneur, Lee Waguchi. Although maybe it's more accurate to say that he and his wife, Sasha, are bi-coastal musicians, working the regular concert season in New England and the summer season in Oregon, pursuing their own startup chamber music series, the Willamette Chamber Music Festival. I got to know Leo about a decade ago when we were on tour together with Star Wars in Concert, playing arena shows all across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. We reconnected a few summers ago when I subbed in for a week with the New Hampshire Music Festival, where he has been a longtime member. The New York Times has called Leo copiously skilled and confident, and Northwest Reverb remarked that he took listeners on a fantastic journey that ended with a breathtaking racing finale to the mountaintop. When we recorded this conversation, Leo and his family had just arrived in Oregon and were in quarantine but staying busy, already teaching lessons online, and as you'll hear, gearing up to launch their ambitious virtual series that includes broadcasts of ensemble performances and appearance from their guest composers, three of the most dynamic American composers on the scene, Gabriella Lena Frank, Jesse Montgomery, and Daniel Bernard Romain. And something special that I'm really looking forward to, on August 7th, the festival releases a premiere recording of a new string quartet by Gabriella Lena Frank, and I'll put a link to pre-order that in the show notes. Their festival takes place within a network of vineyards throughout its namesakes valley, which is one of America's great wine-producing regions. In Oregon alone, the wine business contributes more than $5.6 billion in economic impact. And in reading about it, I came across a quote describing the winemaker's duty during the pandemic that I think could be an analog for musicians trying to maintain their own art form and creations. Jerry Murray of Project M Wines states, The wines don't stop. They need our attention through this process. If we have to start canceling bottling, that could be problematic. It's essential that we be there to monitor progress and stabilize them. Stability and progress have been in short supply these past few months. And Leo observed that personal projects have added an element of resilience in himself and others in the Boston musical community. This health crisis has hit the performing arts particularly hard and has consequences that stretch perhaps farther down the road than for any other sector. On an individual level, the shelf life of diligent practice isn't as long as you might expect if there is no live audience on the horizon. But having some place to put creative energies, something that you have artistic and administrative control over, has been an important outlet. Leo speaks of his two primary orchestras in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Portland, Maine, with great affection, but doesn't hold back about some of the frustrations that many of us have, to be honest, about this line of work. What I heard as a corrective in his answers are a focus on inclusion and the pursuit of visceral connection through proximity between performers and audience, and a passionate buy-in between performers and their repertoire. Along with the pursuit of equity in music education, sharing his own experience, His public school music program was an unexpected gateway to a career. In 1835, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote about the theater in democratic nations. If it be difficult for an aristocracy to present the people from getting the upper hand in the theater, it will readily be understood that the people will be supreme there. When democratic principles have crept into the laws and customs, when ranks are intermixed, when minds as well as fortunes are brought more nearly together. Classical music has rarely been that kind of leveler, and in 2020, that is laid out very plainly. And it runs the risk of what Lawrence Lessig of Harvard University calls institutional corruption, 
where an institution loses effectiveness by coming under the influence of forces that, while neither legal or even unethical, undermine its public legitimacy. And I think this ties in with what Leo observes as the passivity and laziness of some large institutions and the overly commercial focus of others. There is a lot to consider in counteracting that in Leo's career. In particular, it's eclecticism, different scales of ensembles, inclusive programming, equity in education, and connection in live performance. And finally, to again quote de Tocqueville, you may be sure that if you succeed in bringing your audience into the presence of something that affects them, they will not care by what road you brought them there, and they will never reproach you for having excited their emotions in spite of dramatic rules. Please enjoy this interview with Leo Aguchi. Leo Aguchi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, so you're out in Oregon right now, and you've made the trek across the country because you have a chamber music series out there. Tell me how that is going to work this summer. Yes. So like many uh, arts organizations, I might even say all arts organizations right now, we have had to pivot because of COVID-19. Typically what we do, our main programming is a a three-week festival of concerts, chamber music concerts that we do in Oregon wineries and with some really beautiful special places to play. And we pair wines and music together and uh, try to make a really unique experience out of it. But of course, it's not a good idea to gather right now. Mm -hmm. So we have adjusted the model this year to be a live stream only format, um, but live performances nonetheless. It felt really important to us to play music together in person in the wineries that capture the the spirit and the feeling of of what we do and what we're trying to celebrate about Oregon and be able to broadcast as much of that original feel to people as possible. So there won't be a live audience together, gathering together, which is is sad, but we're excited about um, being able to capture the spirit of the thing and uh, bring that to people in their living rooms. And hopefully they've got some nice speakers and Mm -hmm. we're um, trying to make it possible for them to order the wines that pair with the concert and they can crack open a bottle and, and have as close to the real thing as possible. One of the things that's come up in this, in these conversations is that the competitive advantage that organizations and individual artists have had by having an online audience built up or at least having like a, even a, an email list. So did you guys have enough of that infrastructure built up where you could reach out to people in advance somewhere a few months ago and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Would you be willing to join us? We're a fairly young project, uh, but we, we have been actively trying to build that. Mm-hmm. So I would say we had some of that. It's not as It was not as developed as... Um, I wish, but I'm proud of what we've done so far. And we did have a, a, a decent network of people that we could communicate. Sure, and I would imagine there was some kind of synergy with the with the wineries themselves to get that messaging out too. True, though, um, you know, they are in the same sort of disarray that the arts industry is. They, they're back online in a slightly more regular capacity than the arts industry is, but the sort of agricultural aspect of the wineries never ceased. That was deemed to be essential. So the wine, you know, the, the viticulture and the grape cultivation and the winemaking has kept going, but um, everyone who's in charge of running the tasting rooms and events or communicating with customers, um, it's been hard for them too with furloughs and just trying to figure out where to go from there. So, uh, yes, we we do build this as a it is a real collaboration and partnership with the wineries, uh, but they um, they had to hit pause too in the spring. So so uh, again, I think the answer to your question is yes. Some of that yes, and some of it well, you know, we're mm-hmm. we're all figuring it out together. Well, it seems like we can't any of us can't go back. No matter like even if there were vaccine tomorrow. Yeah. It seems like developing these muscles are a part of what we're going to do going forward. I think that's true. For better or for worse. Uh, did your interest in wine predate the Wilmot Valley Chamber Music Festival or did or were those things concurrent? No, it did. Um, so my wife is from here. She's from Oregon, Sasha. 
uh, we would come out here to visit family and sometimes play a little music. And I uh, would go taste wine at the wineries and sort of scope things out. And I was seeing this um, really amazing wine industry in this beautiful place. I, I often describe it to people that like the f the wine scene was like a 10 and the food scene was on its way up and maybe a six or a seven. And the culture scene was like a two or a three. Mm -hmm. Not to say that there wasn't great music happening or great art happening, because there absolutely is. It's, it's a area that's rich with interesting and creative people, but um, there wasn't a lot of it. It sort of felt like, wow, well, let's, you know, talk to some people and see if we could uh, be a part of building something here. And, and uh, local community is, is really thirsty for it. So it's been a nice thing to build together with them. So yeah, I was interested in the wine before and that led me to ask around and see what people thought was needed. And it turned out this was a good fit. So it's been kind of a an accelerant for you, though, probably to get to be able to work with these guys and to see behind the scenes as regularly regularly as you do. Oh, it's great! And you know, I have to say, I when I, whenever we are talking to winemakers, I want to talk about wine. I want to know about other craft and everything that they're doing. They want to talk about music. <laughs> you know, they're um, they want to talk about their. You know, many of them are musicians or creative in other um, disciplines and. Uh, I don't know. It's it's really fun to get together and see where our interests and crafts intersect because actually there's a lot of that. I'm sure, it, like super detail oriented. Would you, is it something that you aspire to try your hand at winemaking? That is, <laughs> uh, you know, I um, I I was a very interested home brewer at one point. I do love I love to cook and I'm I'm interested in fermentation. I spend most of my time um, in Boston, Massachusetts, where it doesn't have a super climate for grape growing. So I have always sort of tabled that idea. Uh, I mean, of course, I, I love it. I think it's fascinating. It's this rich world of sort of a living, it's a beverage, but it's, you know, it's also so much mm -hmm. more than that. It's something that brings people together and it's like, you know, it's experience. Mm -hmm. So I do want yes. to talk about the equilibrium of your life in Oregon, your summer life in Oregon versus your work life back in Massachusetts and throughout New England. But I'm curious about what you said about this being a young organization and coming into a low density cultural network. So do you see the Chamber Music Festival as a to fill a lot of needs artistically or is, I mean, do you see it as a purveyor of standard repertoire? I know that you're a big new music proponent. So do you use it as an opportunity to be also a new music ensemble or how do you segment your audience or do you not at all? We try not to segment our audience. Mm -hmm. No. Um, we basically have one rule about programming and that is that if we're only going to present concerts for a few weeks a year, every piece that gets played, we have to believe passionately about. And that leads us to a really rich mix of programming. So we do always try to have things be balanced, but that's a very vague word. So often that balance is um, a lot of old music with a little bit of new music. Sometimes um, it's a lot of new music with a little bit of old music. Um, it's important to us to have to have a mix in which the, there's old music and new music in conversation with each other. Uh, for example, this year, it was important to us to celebrate, to recognize the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. And we have a, a string quartet on every program this year of Beethoven's. It was also important to us to have those in conversation with a living, breathing composer today who's really in in the moment mm -hmm. so we are featuring each of our weeks of programming this year features a different composer in residence a virtual composer in residence since obviously uh physical residency is a bad idea to have somebody travel um right now for something like this but um we have three great composers this year uh gabrielle alina frank in our first week of programming Jesse Montgomery on our second week of programming and Daniel Bernard Remain on our third. And each brings a really 
unique and vibrant and living, breathing voice right now to the conversation with Beethoven. We find that, um, that that's how we believe in it, but our audiences really respond to that. Mm -hmm. Well, those are three heavy hitters right there, certainly. So <laughs> that's a, an amazing lineup. Did you find that when you guys first launched, you attracted people that were kind of a blank slate in terms of their musical tastes? Or did you attract people that were, to use your word, thirsty for chamber music concerts that hadn't had access to it um, in their backyard? You know, uh, when we first launched, it was mostly Portlanders coming down who were already sort of ensconced in a chamber music scene here and um we're looking to get out of the heat in in, the, in august and drive somewhere pretty mm -hmm. as it has grown and we've made a few more connections in the community it is more of the people who are actually in the communities as well i, I would say as it has grown we have attracted a, a broader uh, cross-section of of people uh, from the willamette valley and also from portland or from um, traveling in from out of town uh, and are here for the wine. I would say that there is definitely a mix of people who come for the music and are really pleasantly surprised and pleased by the experience of, of including the wine and the, the beautiful places. Um, and then there's also a mix of people who find it through the winery because they're on the wine club list or, or something and are just looking for something interesting to do. And, um, have never heard a Beethoven string quartet that live and up close and, and uh, they get hooked too. We're happy to come at it from all of those angles. How long did you kind of have this on the shelf before you actually were able to follow through with it and launch it? Um, that's a good question. I'd say the idea was kicking around for a year, year and a half before I started um, actually working on it, organizing and setting up the, the nonprofit. Yeah, so probably all told two and a half years before we played a note. So how does this balance your life throughout the year as an artist specifically? I mean, obviously, you have, you're, you're trying to fulfill a need in the community um, across the country. You, you have personal reasons for being out there, and those things are obviously fulfilled. But w what, what is it fulfilling for you as an artist um, to run something, to have autonomy over it, um, versus being a member of uh, several different groups back in Boston. Uh -huh. It feels like having a project like this where I have, uh, where I and Sasha have control over programming and production gives us a sort of an amplifier mm -hmm. to our voice in the community. Um, not in a way that we want to tell people what they should listen to, because it's not, I don't mean it in a, I, I don't, value my voice that highly but i do think that if i am passionate about um a composer or a piece or another performer or an idea that somebody else might be also and when you're when you don't have any programming control or administrative control over something um you may like what happens on an individual concert but um you're sort of an employee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you don't have a chance to uh, affect the, where it goes in the same way. It's, and it's not as much a creative process. Mm -hmm. So it, it has always been important to us, for example, at the Lima Valley Chamber Music Festival to program music by women and people of color. And that's not for any reason other than it's amazing music and their stories and voices that we feel like need to be told and we need to hear from. And to be able to then bring composers like Gabrielina Frank and Jesse Montgomery and Daniel Bernard remain to a community. Um, that's what I think needs to be happening. So to, that wouldn't happen any other way. That wouldn't happen if I was just um, playing for somebody else's group. I thought that, and I expressed this to one of my chamber, chamber music guests too, that it seems like from a very practical reasons that chamber music is going to lead this art form out of this pandemic as, as we recover, right? Just because of the logistical part of it, numbers of both the players and the audiences, but also because the audiences tend to be a little bit more resilient. Uh, they're a little bit more hardy, uh, open-minded, and mm -hmm. that you can experiment a little bit more 
And so I also think that, you know, you're going to see with the smaller organizations that have a little bit more room to experiment, that th these kinds of things that you're thinking, and also have a, a demonstrated track record of having done it before the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And so as we've gone through this um, national convulsion together, right. that if, if and when classical music can have a voice in it, this will be it. Are you seeing, I know that we haven't been performing, but even in the Boston community, have you been seeing um, the larger institutions making gestures in that direction that you find adequate? In isolated cases, yes. As a industry, no. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of root causes of that, but um, yes, when it comes to the big institutions, the big five orchestras, the opera companies, um, it there's not enough being done. And I uh, hope to have them get more involved in the conversation. As you've grown in this process and as you've seen your audiences be enriched by these, um, this exposure to composers and performers of different backgrounds, if you were going to talk to the leadership of the large institutions, be they performing arts institutions or the, ac the academic institutions, what would you say to them to say, to, to make the most persuasive case based on your own experience? Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we had this input and then we had this outcome, like this positive outcome. What would you say to those, those folks? Gosh, that's a tough one. I think, you know, the, the thing that is difficult about this is that I think that in most, I'm assuming nine times out of 10 cases, um, the problems are not actively racist or exclusionary. Mm -hmm. They're, they're passive and they're kind of lazy. Uh, it's, it, we're, there's such a feeling in classical music that we just need to sell tickets. We just, you know, it's, um, it's all about whatever's the easiest thing to market. It's not all about that, but it, it often becomes about that. And um, I understand if you're the Met and you're going to invest months, years, millions of dollars into putting on an opera, you really want it to be good. You know, or you were not at not good. You really want it to sell. You really want to recoup as much of your investment as you can. Um, and so they want to go with whatever is a sure bet. And that is often some one that they have already commissioned. And the, there's this cycle that perpetuates itself. So they're very, they're, they're not uh, willing to take risks on people that they haven't already. And, and I don't know what, um, will change their mind about that yet, except that they're going to need to see internally the, the need for it. I think that one, one of the things that the, the, the harshest critics of large organizations, either they don't appreciate or they underweight a little bit though, is the lack of capacity. You know, like my organization, we play 130 concerts a year. And to pivot on that is really, really hard. Yeah. And to move away from the status quo, what is like barely working is still working. And to move away from that is, is, a, tough, is a tough sell. And no one wants to be left holding the bag on a controversial or it was seemingly controversial choice. However, what I think those of us within large institutions fail to appreciate is how un, or indistinguishable some of our music is from something else like so at a really like base level we talk about oh we played brahms four la or two seasons ago we shouldn't play brahms four in the season coming there's three years in between nobody except the programming director remembers that we played brahms three before like that convert but we have those kinds of idiotic conversations as though they're true and the same yeah. thing i think applies particularly when we're talking about overlooked historical music in a particular overlooked historical for american music so because obviously this is a zero sum zero sum game, right? There's only so many concerts, and if, yep. if we take one off, we to put one on, we have to take one off. But if we remove the Dvorak Symphony and put a Florence Price Symphony in there, is it appreciably different? I mean, from an audience standpoint, I don't think that it is. And the benefit, the benefit that is the hard sell, is if you are able to tell a story around it, you might actually have a more engaging 
um, experience for everybody involved. But it does feel very, very risky from yeah. our perspective. And that's so, what I guess. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's what that's yeah. what I'm kind of asking. Like, from someone who's really on the front lines of this and has made this a part of their mission, I want to get to the heart of the persuasion. Well, I think a, a couple of things um, in response to what you just said. I think that if a performer feels passionately about a piece of music and is given a chance to frame it for an audience. And, and we, I, you know, it's important to me in chamber music concerts to be able to address the audience and say a few words, because if it's a piece that no one has heard before, or even if they've heard it once or twice, that's not enough to, to really understand a, a piece of richness and complexity. Mm -hmm. When we, bring a concert to the stage, we've had a week of rehearsals plus however many months of preparing that work. It's, it's already alive in us and we've had a chance to navigate the vocabulary, the musical vocabulary and whatever themes the composer is trying to deal with. If an audience member hears it for the first time and they're just presented a piece of music that they don't know that's unfamiliar, it's often not enough. If it's not close enough to a language that they already speak, they're not mm -hmm. going to get it. Mm -hmm. So I, it's important to me when you're pre performing a new piece or a less familiar piece to have a chance to set it up and say, here is why I think this is valid. Here is what I'm putting into it. And give them a chance then to take to have some inroad to take something away from it, even if they they don't know it. And that is difficult at the orchestral level, for example. Um, but I do think that there are lessons to be learned there about personalizing the music and framing it. And as you said, like telling a story, but orchestras and opera houses are so big and sort of, so corporate feeling, mm -hmm. so institutional feeling that it feels, you know, if you just get the liner notes or something and they're so, they're very carefully um, crafted, um, sometimes kind of sterile, mm -hmm. it's, um, it feels like, you know, it feels like advertising or marketing or something. And people are skeptical of that. If somebody says, speaks from their, their heart about why a thing is valid, it's got a chance. It, you know, people people are open to that, and I I think that as as orchestras have developed over the centuries and the halls have gotten bigger and bigger, it has. You know, uh, I hate to talk about this like fourth wall idea, but like the barrier between the performers and the audience has become greater, and it becomes less human in both in both directions. So, agree. I think anything that can be done to make the programming choices even if they are risk especially if they are risky ones um sort of to hum to, to break put the humanity in them um, i think people are open to it and then they're receptive i think there's another element there too which particularly with orchestras and particularly as orchestras uh, became professionalized and spread out over the country that certainly in boston symphony hall hasn't gotten any bigger right nope. <laughs> but the boston symphony actually maybe the number of players on stage has gotten pretty big but as you go out to the smaller cities in the in, in the u.s where we have full-time professional orchestras you actually have bigger halls that have gotten bigger because they were built multi-purpose and the group is much smaller my former employer um, in louisville kentucky was a perfect example like we were going out on a big stage playing for 2400 seat room with like the bare minimum players to get that sound off the stage. And what I think, so that's, that's actually a physically taxing thing to do from the player's perspective, but it also creates, I think a pretty, um, to use your word, sterile performance because it's not loud enough. It's just, yeah. it's just not in keeping with what people expect to hear in a live performance. So not only are the, the liner notes can be very boring and sterile, but also the performance can sound soft and distant. Even pe people playing their hearts out. Yeah. Yep, um, I agree. I, I think uh, I think that the future, in my opinion, this is just me, but I think what's here. really exciting and vibrant about the future is to get away from the the big spaces and to get away from the feeling of institution and get back to the feeling of 
um, connection and mm-hmm. small spaces and playing for each other in a way where mm-hmm. you're you're right there with me. You can hear me breathe. You can hear me. You can see me sweat. And we're, we're maybe even playing in a living room together again, you know, really playing chamber music, but we're, we're in it together. And it, it, cause then it's, it's totally different than putting on Spotify. Um, Even the greatest orchestras on YouTube, it's, um, it's visceral and you can't check out, you know, you're there. Your attention is right there in the room with me as my demanding my attention and vice versa and then we have this feeling of shared experience where if yes you got up got dressed up and you went out to dinner and you went to the orchestra hall in whatever town you you're in it if the orchestra is 400 feet away it just feels more like watching a movie or something it's it's not it's not the same thing and then it's it sounds boring if if it's that far away or um, at the very least, you don't listen as actively. Yeah, it's, it, it's a big space in which you can lose a lot of people. I mean, I sit from my, from my seat in the in the in the room. I can see out into the audience, and I so I see some people completely enraptured, and mm-hmm. I see some folks looking for the exits. And uh, that's I think that's there's a there's a symptom of that when you're getting that many people under a roof. And that I still think is an orchestra's greatest strength, like. That it's it is obviously in a time like now during a global health pandemic, it's our biggest weakness, you know, because we often occupy some of the most important and agreed upon public spaces in the city, and mm-hmm. sometimes they've been too exclusionary, and maybe still are because of explicit exclusion over the years or price exclusion. But still, like as we bring together people under this roof, I think that's still uh, an, a really important thing to embrace. But as we come out out of this crisis, whenever, whenever that is, I think to your point, we need to get back to some of these first principles of connection and how, or, and how we do that. I don't know. It might be, it's going to be hardest. That's why I said for a chair music, I think it's going to lead the way. It's going to be the hardest for the orchestras. I actually, I just wanted to make one comment um, on something you said now, probably five minutes ago, right. but it's about um, when you said, you know, swapping out Dvorak for a Florence Price symphony. If your orchestra is playing 130 shows a year, Mm-hmm. I guarantee there are some pieces on there written by dead white guys that are just okay. Oh yeah. No arguments. You know? <laughs> or at the very least, maybe, maybe they're really good if, but they take so much creative emotional work, pouring your musicianship in it to craft it, to make something or whatever, or one, a few people think they're great. And a lot of people don't. To me, it's less risky to pull one of those pieces and put something, you know, put something by a woman on, put something by a composer of color, put something by some other underrepresented group. There is wonderful music out there and putting on, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to let my own taste out, but like putting, putting that Nielsen piece on there. Uh, I know some people love Nielsen. I, I don't, I I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, maybe like to me, that's a bigger risk than putting, Florence Price on, I agree. or or Daniel Bernard Remain, or something. Look, and and my only pushback, and it's not a pushback; it's just a, it's an addendum. Is that I think there is a difference between there is a spectrum between okay and great. I think most people, most, and this this is not a criticism; it's not a value judgment about contemporary society or anything like that. I'm just talking about human beings are fairly ambivalent. Right? We're fairly ambivalent about most things. We want a reasonably pleasant experience. We want a reasonably enriching experience. And I think in classical music, we tend to over, overweight everything we do. Right. So if you overweight Dvorak or you overweight For- Florence Price, and I think that the, the real trick is selling, being able to sell these things as something new, something worthwhile. Uh, because we don't even do that with Dvorak because it doesn't, or uh, Dvorak is fine, but like some, <laughs> some, you know, generic, mediocre European composer. And, uh, but we don't have, but what we don't have is the capacity to do that. We don't really have the know-how. And to go back to like the institutional thinking, um, people kind of know what to expect more or less when they come to a symphony concert. So some of those first institutional steps, whether you're a performer or an audience member, are already taken care of. And how we present they sell the music and make it so that people leave the hall wanting to know more um, isn't really what we do for any music. Uh, and so that's something we obviously have to 
um, addressed. Because if you, we, we, you know, most orchestras and certainly in the orchestras I've worked in, we do play a fair amount of contemporary music, but it's done with, without context. And there's a lot of assumptions about what people are going to take away. Um, well, those effective forecasting errors, we do that all the time. <laughs> and uh, I think people leave the hall, not even remember what they heard either way. And I think that is the core of what we need to address. So tell me about, um, so we're recording this in mid-July, and I want to look forward to the fall for whatever things um, are coming up that we might be able to do in small groups. But I'm curious about how this er initially hit the Boston musical community. You're speaking of COVID? Yes. Well, it was hard, certainly. I think it's been hard for musicians, every, any performers anywhere. I will say that we have a wonderful Musicians Union local in Boston, which has been um, very good and helpful at shepherding people through whatever they can to help people get by, mm -hmm. whether that be um, the unemployment process or PPP loans or all the various um, programs that uh, exist right now to support people in need. But aside from the financial end of how it hit, um, I know emotionally and creatively, it's, uh, it's really drained the community. Uh, everyone I talk to, there's sort of a, a group depression. Mm. You know, people were, so a, a few people, I think, were thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to play my Kreutzer etudes eight hours a day. And that lasted for about a week. Mm -hmm. And um, then it, it sank in. I, I don't know when I'm going to be able to perform for people again. And, and there was a, a real wait. I think that those people that have projects of their own to pour themselves into or started projects are faring the best. If, if you already are a freelancer and you're accustomed to having 25 jobs and suddenly 23 of them went away uh, and the other the two that are remaining are your pet projects, well, you could do worse. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's been hard uh, I, for, for my colleagues in Boston, for sure. Uh, Massachusetts has been on the forefront of, of really doing well by COVID. Um, health and safety regulations. You know, we've um, we had a, a pretty big, uh, a pretty steep curve to begin with, and um, our state and local governments have done a, a really good job um, controlling it. I'm knocking on wood because, of course, anything can change in a moment. But the culture of mask wearing and taking care of each other has been has been strong. So uh, the broader community has has done well in that regard, but. Yeah, I would say for the musical community as a whole, the, the idea that we just don't know when we'll ever do what we love again in the way that we understood it before. Um, yeah, that that has been a real weight on people. As an individual, how did how do you fit into what you described? Did you go through? Have you gone through periods of practicing popper etudes for eight <laughs> hours a day? Mm. And uh, so, so actually, I am curious about how it affected you and your own productivity on the instrument. Yeah. I had an initial burst of lots of practicing of uh, popper. Then, <laughs> then it sank in that actually, it's not that I have uh, all of this time, extra time to myself. It's that I still have my regular life, but everything takes twice as long mm -hmm. as before and is twice as complicated, including the fact that um, Sasha and I have an eight-year-old daughter. And it you know, it took about a week or two for Boston Public Schools to get their online teaching up and running, but suddenly we were homeschooling, and on top of trying to get work done at home, on top of trying to practice, and whatever idea I thought of having extra time evaporated pretty fast, <laughs> uh, and it it which is fine. It uh, transitioned into something something different. Um, where actually it's been, it was a joy to be a part of homeschooling mm -hmm. um, and be a part of um, setting up a writing Zoom with her teacher and, and being in on that or doing homework with her or whatever. And it's a joy to be teaching my students over Zoom, even though it's not the same thing, but, uh, uh, and some in many ways take, is, goes slower and it takes more time. But um, that, that is great, but it definitely took away from the 
a feeling of, oh, I have unlimited time to for self-improvement. <laughs> yeah. I, my, my sourdough baking has gotten better. <laughs> I'm yeah. curious, do you think that now that we're all experiencing this together, like our, our all institutions, public, private, or whatever, they're going through the same crisis, do you think it's going to force some national conversations or even statewide conversations about things like childcare? Do you think that because every parent is going through this, something similar to you, that this is going to change the, the national conversation about public policy like that? I think it'll have an effect. I think uh, I'm not confident that it'll have a federal effect yet, but I do think that, um, uh, you know, certainly in Massachusetts there at the state level, there's um, conversation going on Pe that people are realizing in 2020, mm -hmm. the economy can't fully open until we've got childcare sorted out. There's just so much that's predicated on your kids not climbing on your head when you're trying to have a, a Zoom meeting or so, you know, it's, yeah, the education piece and the childcare piece needs to be sorted out before we can really uh, be back to back to running full steam ahead. And, and, and Massachusetts has been starting those conversations. So tell me about in more normal times, tell me about mm. your work life around New England, all the different places you play and how you, and how you make that network work for you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, so during the non-summer months, the regular season months, I'm a freelancer. I perform a lot of chamber music, a fair amount of orchestra work um, with uh, a couple of regular things and a couple of uh, freelance things. And I teach a bit and I do a bit of solo performing. My main chamber music project during the year is a group called Sheffield Chamber Players. Mm -hmm. which is kind of a flexible string ensemble um, up to six people. There's five core members. We play, we have made a decision to try to bring chamber music into small spaces to really connect with people. So we play a lot of concerts for a few number of people uh, by design. So we play a lot of house concerts or small venue concerts. And we play, I think this year was uh, almost 50 in the Boston area. Oh. Um, we prepare four programs a year, and then uh, we have a, a fairly extensive network of people now. We built a lot of community around this, and uh, people have the opportunity to host it at their home or some other venue. We do play traditional venues too, but um, but the point is to try to make it small, and then it also means that we can play the program a lot. So we this year we played, for example, um, we did the. Sitkovetsky arrangement of Box Goldberg variations for string trio. I watched you guys on Facebook Live. Oh, that's <laughs> bless your heart. Uh, but so, so we got to play that program um, twelve times, which uh, is an amazing gift. Um, yeah, it's an underappreciated thing. It truly is. Um, it truly is. Does the Sheffield Chamber Players does that predate the Wilmot Valley Enterprise? They started their conception at about the same time, but um, the first notes were played for Sheffield sooner. The Willamette Valley Chamber Music Festival is about to uh, about to enter its fifth season and um, of concerts, and Sheffield is about to start its seventh. So the groups that you play with the orchestras, do they have um, like different personalities? Do you feel like you're going into very different places when you go up to Portland than when you play in New Bedford? Absolutely, absolutely, and and I think that they really take on personalities of their community of their town. So New Bedford, Massachusetts is this scrappy, vibrant, historical place. I mean, it was one time, at one time, the center of the world during the whaling my, industry. One was, of my ancestors was the founder of New Bedford, Henry Tabor. Oh, yeah. Uh, like yeah. Tabor Academy. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful town with this rich, rich cultural history uh, that collapsed when whaling collapsed. Mm -hmm. And it has really built itself. It's it's come back and built itself through uh, immigration, through this rich uh, Portuguese community, mm -hmm. among others. And it's uh, it's 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 just got this spirit. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing place. And you're right; it is it is a scrappy town. One of the other little interesting connections is to, to Rochester is that Frederick Douglass lived in New Bedford for a little while before he oh, came to Rochester. Yeah, he worked in he worked in the docks after he oh, was wow. slavery. Yeah, wow. So I, I would say that, um, the orchestra in New Bedford it has a lot of that character. It's 
flexible. It's not so set in its ways. If if it, if um, programming needs to go a direction, or we need to try some new programs, we need to take things in a different direction. Somebody's got some educational ideas or something. It's one of the quickest boats to turn. Hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, people often describe trying to make a change in an orchestra like steering a an ocean liner, and um, it's a much more agile boat than that. Interesting. Uh, it's still an orchestra, but it's uh, it's really interesting, and and I would invite anyone to check out their educational program. They have a really industry leading educational program that has been great for the community. And then Portland, Maine, is a wonderful town that you know that shares some spirit with New Bedford. You know, it's another um, another city that made its name through its port and has this rich connection to the sea, and and a lot of history. It's uh, it's got much more of a Mainer spirit than it does uh, a scrappy immigrant spirit. And it's lovely and it's friendly and it's a little cantankerous occasionally, as uh, sometimes Mainers are. But we, the, the orchestra community is really uh, kind of family oriented. Mm. You know, it, there's, you know, there's always, every orchestra has politics and every orchestra has somebody that's been mad at somebody since 1972 or something. Um, but in Portland, everybody works it out. We, everybody figures it out together. Uh, everybody is kind of in the same boat in a really nice New England spirit. That's awesome. As the country's become more urban and second tier and third tier cities have become more cosmopolitan, I cannot think of a place that has gone through a more radical change than from when I was a kid and we go up there, uh, a lot of relatives in Maine, um, further north. But um, yeah, what a place it has gone like in a, in a 180 direction. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And I love, um, I often <laughs> have to travel from one Portland to the other. They That Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon share a lot in common. One of which is this amazing food scene. Yeah, they're the right. two, they're the two best towns in, in the country to eat in, in my humble opinion. Uh, it's just the Portland, Maine is just, it's such a great um you know, people want to live. People want to eat well. They, um, they want to be out. They want it's it's wonderful. Yeah, I agree. I, Portland is an outlier because, at least in New England, um, because I say this about my own environment. Like New Englanders, we don't always have the greatest <laughs> sense of food. I think you know, <laughs> some of the blandest, worst restaurants in America are in Boston, and uh, and then you go up just up the highway a little bit, and you get this rich culture. And that is like a 19th century, huge waves of 19th century immigration in mm. Portland. That I think that made it an interesting place, and and that and has downstream culture. You know, like so much of the, I mean, the temperance movement started in Portland, right? Mm. So, so someone in the wine business, <laughs> right? yeah. like the prohibition basically started in Portland with uh, the mayor there. I think his name was Neil Dow. Okay. And, uh, but that was an anti-immigrant schism, right? That was the, it was sort of an anti-Irish, anti-German 19th century version of what we're going through right now. Um, Tell me about, uh, so you grew up in Mich Michigan. Tell me mm -hmm. about your education growing up at music, but I also want to hear about having this dual undergraduate degree in physics and music. Mm, sure. Well, I should say I, I wouldn't be doing what I was doing without music education. And I don't mean that in the like usual, I wouldn't be here without my teacher's way. But I literally was in a public school with a great strings program and so in somebody handed me a cello in fifth grade and said, you can have group class for free. Actually, they said you could pick an instrument and I picked the bass and I went home and I told my mom, I was like super excited to play the bass. And she said, can you look around for a second and look at how small our apartment is? Go pick something smaller. Mm -hmm. So I came back and I was like, what's the next biggest? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, here's a cello kid. <laughs> uh, and I, yeah, I liked it. You know, the, and I got free strings class and um, I signed up for it again the next year. And they said, you know, you should really think about private lessons. And my parents didn't have a lot of money. So the woman who taught the strings program um, gave me private lessons, sometimes in exchange for whatever money we had and sometimes in exchange for, you know, baked goods or dinner or whatever. My, my mom's a great cook. And it, it just, it sort of took. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think one 
thing that our industry needs to not forget about is that if we don't solve the music education component and how to support people learning music if they don't come from means, we're never going to fix our issues of diversity. I think um, it's it's a rich man's game. And so if you don't have the money for lessons or instruments, or even if you have some program that supports you to get those two things and you don't have professional support in your early career when you're so vulnerable or mentorship, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really hard. You said it stuck with you. So how long before you, you knew you wanted to pursue this, not as a career, but as a, as a, as a kid, you were going to, uh-huh. what was the moment or not the moment, but where was about the, the how many months in were you, when you realized I want to stick with this for a while? Well, I always liked it. I will say, if I'm being completely honest, I, I didn't like practicing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and I had a lot of other interests, as, as we already talked about. Like, I was, you know, I was into science. I was also a football player. And I did, you know, like every 15-year-old boy want to play in the NFL. Mm-hmm. I'm super glad I didn't. Because um, I, I didn't start out with enough brain cells. And I'm glad that I have at least two or three left to rub together. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't, I think I, it was around like age 17 when I was, when I decided I really wanted to make a go of music, at which point my my teacher, my private teacher, who was really old school, she was this East German woman who she could call them like she saw them. And she said, Nope, it's too late for you. I won't, I won't support this. I won't write you a recommendation letter. You go do, you're smart, go do something else. Uh, uh, which actually was um, probably the chip on my shoulder that I needed to, hmm. you know, to work my butt off. And I did all my auditions behind her back and I got into a school and, and it was, it was great. And then, then I quickly realized that, um, oh, she was maybe right. I'm like super far behind everybody else because I didn't start when I was four Mm -hmm. and I didn't grow up in a classical music family. So I don't know any of the repertoire and I don't, I didn't grow up um, living and breathing the appropriate ways to phrase something. And um, yeah, it was, it was around 17. And then, and then when I got to college, oh, and also my, my dad, who was, um, an engineer, he really couldn't imagine what he couldn't envision a career in music, and um, he it was important to him that I not lose my science studies, uh, which actually was fine. I, I was interested in that, and and I figured, well, you know, just in case, I'll hedge my bets and I'll study science as well, study physics. I love physics, and um, I really did love both, and but there was a point then when I was um, probably a sophomore in, in undergrad that I realized my music friends and my science friends were, my physics friends in particular, were were really the same people, mm-hmm. but the, the physics people were the introverts and the music people were the extroverts. And I was really having fun playing music with people. And I was not having that much fun in the lab, despite the fact that I loved uh, learning conceptually about it. So, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was around then that I, I really uh, went towards music and made a go of it. Was there a period of negotiation, like either internally or externally, in terms of finishing the physics degree then, if, you, if you'd if already kind of made this decision halfway through? No, I wanted to finish it, uh, I, d- despite the fact that it was an incredible amount of work. Um, I Yeah, it was something that I I had set out to do, and I wanted to make sure I could do it. And I did, you know, want to know, not that I knew uh, if global pandemics were coming or anything, but there was a part of me that knew I wanted to be a well-rounded thinking person. And if I ever needed to do something else, I mean, basing your career on the viability of your shoulders or your fingers or whatever tendons is, it's a little vulnerable. So yeah, I did. um, Once I was down that path, I wanted to see it through. Well, I certainly agree that. I certainly agree that a physics degree um, signals a lot of things to a lot of people, myself included. But do you feel that that, that degree program made you a more well-rounded person? I mean, obviously the subject matter is inc- deeply interesting to you, but 
those two worlds were complements, it sounds like. They complemented each other, introvert and extrovert. But did you find that that undergraduate education really did make you see the world differently than you would have if you had been just a music student? I think so. It would be difficult for me to maybe put my finger on on all of the ways of why, but I do think that it has changed. I, if I compare myself to what to my musical colleagues who were only on a conservatory track since when they were little, I do think that there's a, not to say that I'm better rounded than them, but I, I think that I, I analyze the world in a different way. And, and that has, that carries over into my playing that it, how I analyze my technique, how I analyze music, how I uh, make decisions. Yeah, I wondered that. Do you do you think there's a connection between your physics background and your interest in the contemporary music? The kind of just figuring out how things work. Probably a little. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's there's often that puzzle aspect to, to new music mm-hmm. to to figure out how do I make this fit? How do I? What's really going on here? Like, how does you 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 get this piece and it's a you have to sort of reverse engineer what's it about and what makes it tick. So yeah, I, I think um, to some extent that's true. So tell me how it was different than going on to grad school and focusing solely on the cello. Well, actually, it was a shock. <laughs> I uh, uh, getting to grad school and only living, breathing music. Uh, it was hard at first. I I was I I was a little thirsty for some other things, mm-hmm. um, and I did make a point of only applying to grad schools that had that were universities that had decent physics programs thinking i you know still thinking that i would you know attend some lectures and you know maybe make some connections and and stay involved and i didn't at all actually so i went to boston university college of fine arts um where it's very segmented i i thought that it would be easier to cross um between the schools in in the university and it was um it was difficult uh which was um at the time was an adjustment but was fine i mean it was i needed to focus on what i was at grad school for and that was that was actually ultimately good for me do you think there was when you say it was difficult to cross between schools was that like a logistical thing or where there just wasn't much interest in having a music student come over or vice versa i think that there's certainly interest and i, I this is not to to bash bu but i think there's just a culture of each college doing their own thing and it's difficult to be in the between space well Leo, i think this is a probably a good place we've covered a lot of ground here <laughs> so to wrap up do you have any recommendations on things to listen to composers to check out books to read anything like that sure uh always um well i'm excited about these three composers i already mentioned mm-hmm. about that we're working with this summer and I guess as long as I'm recommending, I'm, I'm going to make a, a selfish pitch for a second and that we have a new Gabrielle Alina um, Frank album of string quartets coming out this year that will be out on August 7th that I'm super excited about. It has a world premiere of one of her string quartets. So I hope some people will check that out and enjoy that. Um, I am super excited about, I've been doing a deep dive into Osvaldo Golihov's music. and. Um, on the subject of books, um, actually, um, his his partner Leah Hager Cohen uh, is this wonderful author um, who writes nonfiction and fiction. Who um, I would recommend people check check her writing out. It's it's really exquisite. Um, I'm I'm really interested in uh, the composer Gabriella Smith. Um, she's somebody I'm excited about and, uh, looking forward to programming and playing, playing more music from. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's what, that's what's on my mind today. Ask Fantastic. me tomorrow. You might get a completely different, uh, different list. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for making time. Oh, it's a, it's a real pleasure of, and, um, good luck with this project. I think it's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you for listening. The music on the show, as always, is by the guitarist Craig Wagner from Louisville, Kentucky. We'll be back soon with more interviews. The next one features violinist Melissa White from the Harlem String Quartet. So please go ahead and hit subscribe.